All right, guys, I'm going to give you a few more minutes. We're still missing about 10 people. Um, we're up to 32, 33 in our Zoom and only 22 in our Pear Deck. So if you can make sure that you join pd.com and enter the code. There are any teachers in the Zoom call tonight? Will you uh, send me a message in chat and just let me know? All right, we're gonna give it about one more minute. Still missing about seven or eight of you. So if you can just go to joinpd.com, put in the code that you see at the top of the screen or in the chat. And we'll get started. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. We want to make sure that we get you out on time. I know your time is valuable. And if you are like my students, then you probably have lots of homework and lots of after school activities. And so we just want to be mindful of your time, um, but also welcome you and say we're so glad you're here. Um, today is, oh, what are we at? The six. We are less than a month away from the AP exam on May 5th. Um, so we're in the countdown. So hopefully tonight is a really good review for you guys. Um, we are going to be looking tonight at time period six and time period seven. Um, so we're going to be reviewing those time periods, reviewing content from those time periods, broad topics um, down to SFI. We're also going to be looking at some practice multiple choice questions. Um, we will look at, we'll just go back over one more time, thesis and contextualization, just a few reminders on those. I know that's what the last few sessions have been about, but we're just going to touch on those one more time. And then the last thing we'll do is look at some document analysis, okay? Some happying of some documents and how you can use those. If you are on a smartphone or an iPad um, on the Pear Deck, you may have to use the two finger zoom feature. Um, one of the things that's going to ask you to do is draw a line. And so you're going to have to make that smaller so that you can actually do that. Um, my name is Miss Flinko and I teach AP US history at Homewood High School. Our co host tonight is Miss Allen and she teaches AP US history at Leeds High School. Um, she teaches AP in two years and I teach it in one year. So you have the best of both worlds here to help you. Um, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to turn on your mic and ask us, or you can also message in the chat to Miss Allen um, and she can get back to you on whatever your questions are. All right. So with all that said, we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, and the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to look at this question. Okay, so your question is, conditions like those shown in the image contributed most directly to which of the following?
All right. Um, great job. So the majority of you answered this correctly. Um, and the correct answer for this is B, an increase in progressive reform activity. Um, so one thing to note, guys, if you get it wrong, you don't have to change your answer. It's no big deal. No one's seeing it. It's not going to count off for you. Um, the other answer that people um, chose, and I feel like this is one of those questions where you could get it down to two answers, um, was D, the weakening of labor unions. So one thing I would point out in this image to help you know that this really wouldn't be about labor unions is the picture is depicting children. Um, for the most part, they look younger um, and younger age teenage, young, they wouldn't have been in labor unions, okay? So this wouldn't have really affected labor unions um, very much in this image. So one thing you're going to see, guys, as we go through these multiple choice questions is usually you can get it down to two answer choices. Um, sometimes one of the answer choices is clear that it's the correct answer, um, but sometimes you really have to figure out, okay, which one is more correct? Because um, sometimes they can both look correct when you get it down that close. So let's keep going and look at some other questions, okay? Advocates for individuals such as those shown in the image would have most likely agreed with which of the following perspectives? Okay, so again, predominantly y'all answered C, which is correct. So impressed with your answering skills so far. This is a great indicator of your knowledge. Um, one of the answers that I have seen students choose for this one sometimes is B, um, the wealth and poverty are products of natural selection. Um, that would have been a belief at the time Okay, so that would have fit into your time frame. It would have fit into the question. But people who thought that, who thought that wealth and, po and poverty are products of natural selection, they would not be advocates for those who needed advocacy. Okay, they wouldn't have been those for children labor or prohibition or working conditions because they would have felt like it was selected naturally. All right, here's your next question. Um, we're looking at immigration to the United States. So which of the following best accounts for the curve on the graph depicting immigration to the United States from Asia, Africa, and the Americas from 1882 to 1900? All right, so looking at this question, um, this question we have some answers a little more across the board, um, but for the most part, predominantly you guys answered B, um, and that is correct, restrictive congressional legislation. So if you look at the map, or sorry, not the map, the graph, um, you can see that around 1882 is the highest spike in immigration. And from that point on, there is a drop. Okay, so what you're wanting to know is why was there a drop in immigration from Asia and Africa to the Americans during this time? Okay, um, and the only answer choice that would answer that is restrictive congressional restriction. 
um, rapid expansion of the British Empire into the Southern Hemisphere. That wouldn't have been the right time frame. Reduction of potential immigrant populations by widespread epidemics. That doesn't fit either because we don't have any knowledge of there's no widespread epidemic at that time there. And then immigration to less settled areas of the world that that wouldn't have happened either. So this was a pretty um, this was a pretty straightforward question to where if you could understand the graph and understand that there was a drop, then you're looking for what caused that drop. Sometimes, guys, your graphs are going to help you like this question, but sometimes they're not going to help you. Um, so just make sure that you can understand that as well. All right, same graph, different question. What is one effect on U.S. society of the trend denoted in the immigration graph? Hey guys, this is just a friendly reminder too, okay? Um, there are 27 people actively participating at the moment, but there's 33 in the class roster and there's 36 on Zoom. So make sure that you have not just turned on your computer and walked off and not answering questions, okay? Wanna make sure we get our answers in so you get credit for being here. All right, um, the correct answer for this that most of you chose is A, an increased nativism within the urban centers of the U.S. Um, so one thing that you would need to know is some vocabulary words in this answer choice. You would need to know what nativism is, and you would also need to know urban. Okay, so nativism is referring to um, anti-immigration, okay, wanting, wanting native to your own country. Um, and then urban is having to do with cities. Okay, so if you know about this time frame, again, you can look at the map, look at the years we're looking at. We know that this is in the end of the industrial boom, the, bi the big urbanization of cities. And one of the things that led to that was increased immigration. Okay, so with increased immigration, always comes increased nativism. Um, so I would also, you know, point that back to previous time periods. That is a continuity over time. That's one of the things that AP asks you to do is continuity and change over time. Um, and this is a continuity that anytime there's a big boom in immigration, there's a nativist response from Americans. All right, same chart. Next question. All right, um, great job. Again, majority is correct on this. The correct answer is C, the West Coast, okay? Um, you would know that due to the fact that this would have something to do with around the same time frame as the Chinese Exclusion Act, okay? So if you can remember that there were a majority of Asian immigrants, they were working on the railroads, the Pacific Railroad line. So you're gonna have an increase in Asian immigrants to the West Coast. They're gonna come in through Angel Island. Okay, you're gonna have two different big points of immigration during this time, Angel Island on the West Coast and Ellis Island on the East Coast. 
and the majority of Asian immigrants came in from the West Coast and Angel Island and settled along the West Coast. All right, I'm going to give you some time and let you read this question, and then we'll answer this last one. Nope, we have two more. All right, so we're kind of all over the board on this question. Um, so a couple of things I want to point out. Um, number one, when you get a question that has any type of writing prompt, any type of writing, sorry, not prompt, any type of writing stimulus, whether it's a speech like you're seeing here by Franklin Roosevelt or a quote or a diary entry or a document, you always want to read the source first. Okay, the source is going to tell you a lot and it's going to help you. Okay, so some things we know before even reading this passage is we know this was Franklin Roosevelt. We know that he's the president during World War II. And we know that this is around the beginning of World War II, okay, in 1937. So in 1937, you have to think what was the prevailing, that means the approach before Franklin Roosevelt what was the approach, okay, going on to foreign policy? And that approach after World War I was isolationism. We want to we want to pull tight. We don't want to help our brothers and sisters. We don't want to expand. We're focusing on us here, okay? Um, but what he's arguing here for in this speech is A, he's arguing to expand the role of the United States in the world. Um, and the reason he's doing that, if you look at about the fourth, line down, fourth, fifth line down. He says, um, instincts which today are creating a state of intentional anarchy and instability from which there is no escape through mere isolation or neutrality. So he's saying we can't be isolationist or neutral, okay? Um, the other answer choice that I think you could have gotten this down to would be B. Um, in encouraging the United States to avoid political entanglements in Europe. But I think the key here is knowing that that would have been the prevailing thought would be to avoid um, and stay neutral. But he is going against that. And it tells you that he's going against that prevailing thought. All right. So answer choice is A. All right. Last multiple choice question we're going to practice for a little bit.
All right. I feel like we got a lot of answers in um, and they're kind of pretty even. Um, D is the correct answer to this, overcome opposition to participate in the impending second war. Okay, so let's think about what I just told you. The prevailing belief, meaning the belief that he was having to argue against was isolationism. Let's stay neutral, let's isolate. So if he's trying to get them to do not that, the option here would be to participate in the impending second war, okay? All right, so we are gonna be looking at some review content from time period six and time period seven. So if you can move your blue dot on how confident you feel about time period six. And if there is anyone in the group right now who has not covered time period six and time period seven or six or seven, um, would you please message Miss Allen in the group chat and let her know? It's totally fine. If you're a school that's doing it in two years and you are the first year, chances are you are not to time period six and time period seven. Um, so we just want to make sure that we have a good view of what you've covered in class so far, okay? And I'm going to ask you to make a call, like, don't give me right in the middle, okay? <laughs> give me like, man, eh, we feel kind of good or, oh, I feel good. That way I can gauge a little better. All right, what about time period seven, 1890 to 1945? We usually feel better about time period seven. <laughs> That's not surprising. Most people usually do time period six is a little harder. Um, so not terribly surprised about that. All right. All right, so reviewing content, where do I start? Um, I am actually in the process of reviewing for the AP exam with my class right now. We started this week reviewing for the exam. We finished all our content. Um, and one of the things that I've really been working with my students on is trying to grasp big picture first and then your specific ideas in the middle. Okay, so what this looks like um, is the broad topics, okay, so think big topics, American Revolution, industrialization, imperialism, World War II, okay? You're thinking of those big topics first, and then below that, you're going to think about the specific factual information. What goes within each of those? Okay, so your SFI, we're going to say that a lot, SFI stands for specific factual information, okay? Um, your SFI is going to fit within your broad topics, okay? So go ahead and think if you can think of this for a minute. I'm going to give you a minute and looking at your answer, see what you think. All right, so what we're gonna do here, guys, we're gonna do something called bookend, okay? I actually did this with my students today. We were reviewing time period three. Um, so bookend, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause you actually. I'm gonna go right here just for a minute so you don't write that I'm gonna come back to it, okay? Um, so bookend, when you're bookending a topic, AP is not most likely, not going to say never, but most likely they're not going to be wanting you to recall a specific date, April 1st, 1972. That's not as much what they're looking for. But what they're looking for is do you understand 
the sequence of events, the way things happen. Okay, so we call this bookending. So for time period three, for example, if we're bookending time period three, we're going to start with the French and Indian War, okay, 1754-ish. We're going to end with the end of Jefferson's, I mean, sorry, the end of Washington's presidency, okay, right before Jefferson becomes president in 1800. So we'd have Washington and Madison. Everything in between that is our big topics that we kind of want to think about how do they fit in line? Okay, well, we know French and Indian War led to taxes. So then we get into all the taxes and the Boston Massacre and the Tea Party, which led to the American Revolution. After the American Revolution, we had the Articles of Confederation. Then we had the Constitution. Then we had Hamilton and Jefferson and how were they going to run the government? So think about those as you're thinking about how do we bookend a time period. So what you're going to do is we're going to try and we're going to practice bookending time period six. Okay, so what would you say is the first event that kind of starts time period six? And what's the bookend event that ends time period six? And between those, list as many broad topics as you can think about. I'm going to give you about two or three minutes to do this. All right, so looking at your responses, most of you can, can start with the first bookend, 1865, which is the end of the Civil War. Um, after that, we get a little bit hairy, okay? Where do we go after the end of the Civil War? Well, we're gonna have reconstruction, we're gonna have industrialization, we're gonna have big business, um, Jim Crow era, more immigration, the Industrial Revolution, closing of the Western frontier, and then some issues with Native Americans. All right, so what we're gonna do here is I want you to draw a line, and this is where I told you you may have to use that feature and make it smaller, okay? So you're gonna draw a line just like a matching from where each one of these would match to their big topics. So the black um, on the left and the right are gonna be your SFI. The middle is going to be your broad topic. So see if you can match your SFI to your broad topic. Um, and the other thing I would ask you to do, if there is something on here that you are like, I have no idea what this is. What is this even talking about? If you would circle it, okay? That way we have an idea, like if everybody has circled one thing, then we can make sure we touch on that.
I'll give you about two more minutes. I'm looking at your answers. Remember guys too, if you'll make sure on the right, left, middle, if there's any that you're like, no idea what that is, if you would circle it for me, so I make sure that we cover that. I don't see any circled so far, which is a great sign. And we'll be about 10 more seconds. All right. Um, so just want to touch base on some of these. So one thing I would recommend doing, guys, hopefully you have a phone, something with you, piece of paper, anything. Um, these terms that you don't know, I would write them down, okay? You're gonna get a printout of these, but you may not remember to go back and look at this. Um, so I would, while we're going over the answers to this, I would maybe just jot them down on a piece of paper. Make sure you understand. Okay, so the way this looks to you guys, this is um, color-coded, okay? So for example, the top one that we're seeing, the Gilded Age, the corruption of the Gilded Age, um, that is going to be the navy blue terms, okay? So we see whiskey ring, cross of gold speech, boss tweed, and muckraker. Um, one of the things that I saw circled a good bit on this was the whiskey ring. Um, so one thing if you can think about, guys, the Gilded Age. Gilded Age is known for the political corruption that took place during the Gilded Age, um, all the way from presidencies, from um, Ulysses S. Grant's presidency to the Senate, okay, you've probably seen that image, um, the bosses of the Senate, okay, where you see the big guys behind the Senate members, okay, that represents the corruption and unfairness during the Gilded Age. So the whiskey ring, I do want to point on this because a lot of you asked about it. Um, the whiskey ring was a scandal during Ulysses S. Grant's presidency. Okay, so that would be one thing you would need to know. Um, the cross of gold speech, okay, that's going to be William Jennings Bryan. Um, and that is going to have to do with um, the West, Western farmers wanting silver, wanted silver coinage, okay, because of inflation and money they owed, it would have made it easier. And so he gives this speech saying, don't hang us to a cross of gold. OK, um, the next big thing we see rise of big business in the second industrial revolution. Um, so some things you're going to see with this social Darwinism, the Sherman Antitrust Act, um, Rockefeller. This is going to be your time of robber barons. OK, um, the Interstate Commerce Act, vertical horizontal integration, that connection with robber barons, U.S. Steel. Um, those are all having to do with how did big business, how did it rule basically the cities and urbanization, okay? 
that's going to lead the big business, the rise of big business is going to lead to labor movements and urbanization in cities. Um, so labor movements, the American Federation of Labor is created in this. You're going to have some riots like the Haymarket riot. Okay, so big thing to know here is labor unions are rising up against the corrupt business in the Industrial Revolution. The next big topic we have is urbanization. Okay, urbanization has to do with the growth of cities. Um, so tenements, um, remember that was that new style of living, apartment style living, made possible by industrialization, by the increase in steel. Okay, um, you also have the social gospel. Okay, this idea that um, if you're a member, um, the social gospel was this idea that those that were extremely wealthy were supposed to give away their wealth. This is what Carnegie believed, um, but they didn't believe, and this is really important, social gospel in this time, there was not this belief in giving away your gospel, your, sorry, your money to individuals. OK, this is why they gave money to institutions like libraries, colleges, um, museums. You're going to see business buildings, government buildings named after them. The next is Jim Crow era, and this has to do with the South after the Civil War. OK, post Reconstruction. Biggest thing we're going to have in the Jim Crow era is Plessy versus Ferguson, that Supreme Court law that said separate was equal. Um, that's going to go into black codes where you're going to have things like literacy tests and voting speculation. So remember, guys, after the Civil War, right during Reconstruction, there was actually some pretty um, big growth in voting rights for African Americans, but that's going to change during the Jim Crow era. The next big topic we have in time period six is going to be new immigration. Okay, so looking at the Chinese Exclusion Act, Jane Addams, the whole house, um, this idea of helping immigrants assimilate into American culture. All right, next, closing the frontier. A lot of you circled um, the Turner thesis, okay? Turner thesis, this was um, a thesis written by Frederick Turner, and it basically said that the West was closed off, meaning that America had expanded as far West as they could, that everything in the West had been explored, it was being developed, um, that we're not moving, if you think about time period five, Time period five was this bringing in Western territories, making it part of the United States. And then you had the Civil War. So Frederick um, Turner, his thesis is saying the West is closed off. It is fully developed. That is going to be really important when we get to time period seven, because the West being closed off is one of the justifications for imperialism for going into other nations and taking land was this idea that the West is closed off now. Um, and then last, we have Native American relations in the 18, um, late 1800s. The Dahl Severity Act um, and the Carlisle School, those have to do with assimilating Native Americans into American culture, um, taking over at the Battle of Wounded Knee. So, those are kind of our big topics in time period six. So again, guys, if there's anything that you're like, that I had no idea what that was, I would go ahead and jot that down, circle it, take it with you so that you can look at that with your AP teacher or on your own and review. All right, we're going to do the same thing for time period seven. You got about two minutes. So if you can think about bookending this for me, what's the beginning of time period seven and what's the end of time period seven?
Hey guys, just a friendly reminder, we can see your answers. All right, so time period seven, if we're looking at our bookend years, okay, again, what's kind of the beginning of time period seven, what's the end? We're looking at 1890 to 1945. Um, so the big thing that's going to kind of spark 1890 is we've just been through industrialization, okay, so we have all these new products and this new market, and we need somebody, we need somewhere to send products, so we need something to help us with that. Um, we also have closed the Western frontier. So 1890, the start is going to be imperialism, okay? Also, an kind of simultaneously, along with imperialism, we also have the progressive era taking place, okay? So coming off of the harshness of industrialization and urbanization, those problems we got to fix, okay? Progressive and imperialism happening at the same time, and we're going to end in 1945 with the end of World War II. All right, so just like I said, here's our broad topics for time period seven. We're gonna have overseas imperialism, the progressive era, those are happening simultaneously. World War I, um, military and what's World War I on the home front. Then we have the roaring 20s, the Great Depression, New Deal, and then World War II. All right, so do the same thing that you did last time for time period seven. And right, I'm going to give you about one more minute and then we're going to get going. So remember, if you have any questions, you can circle them or you can message Miss Allen in the chat or myself in the chat and we'll make sure we get that for you.
All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and get us to our key. <coughs> so we can go through some of these. So we're going to start with overseas imperialism. OK, so big thing to know is what is the big thing that starts the overseas imperialism? And that's going to be the Spanish-American War. OK, so um, USS Maine. OK, I always tell my students one way to remember um, Spanish-American War is a note in a boat. OK, the note, the USS Maine. Um, yellow journalism. OK, that is that um, I, if you can think about it today, it's like tabloids. OK, so yellow journalism played an important role in overseas imperialism um, because they they heightened what was going on in overseas imperialism to get people in the United States to back going into these other countries and taking over. Um, we have Teddy Roosevelt in this time. OK, Teddy Roosevelt's going to be your big imperialist president, um, that big stick diplomacy where he said, carry a big stick and speak softly. Um, the open door policy with China, and then the Roosevelt Quarterly. Um, progressive era. One of the questions that I saw a lot of you had circled um, had to do in the progressive era, and that was the court case Mueller v. Oregon. Um, Mueller v. Oregon had to do with women's rights, and it was limiting the women's work day to 10 hours to protect their womanhood and motherhood. Okay, so that was part of that progressive era of limiting the amount of work hours that they could participate in. Um, we have the Standard Oil Company, which is going to be brought down in the progressive era. The Jungle, that's probably the most notable one. Okay, Upton Sinclair, when he writes about the meat packing industry, um, he was actually writing to depict the harsh work conditions, but what came out of that was the need for restrictions on food and drug. This is how the FDA came about, the Food and Drug Administration. Um, and then you're gonna have things like the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory too. So big thing in the progressive era to remember that is different from previous eras is the progressive era salt changes by the government, not people. Okay, in previous times, they were calling on socials, on people to make changes. But Progressive Era is really calling on the government to make changes. Um, then we're going to go into World War I. Okay, so in World War I, we're going to have military and diplomacy and World War I on the home front. Okay, so um, one of the biggest things to know about World War I is you're going to have that first... Um, you're going to have that court case of Schneck versus the U.S., okay? And this is that idea, guys, and you see this all the way from the beginning with um, Madison all the way through really 9-11 of that when the country is in times of war or times of crisis, that your rights can be taken away, okay? So just make sure that you remember that in all those different court cases, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on World War I, big thing, Zimmerman telegram. Um, Wilson's 14 points is another big part of World War I, um, where Wilson suggested the United States get involved in that League of Nations. We didn't. It ended up leading to some problems in Europe, which is eventually one of the causes of World War II. Um, and then those Espionage and Sedition Acts. Again, same thing. In times of crisis, your rights can be taken away. The Espionage and Sedition Act show that. Then we get into the Roaring Twenties, um, where you're going to have mass consumerism, this idea of let's go back to normal. The U.S. is going to retreat into isolationism. So we don't want to be imperialistic. We don't want to be in the world. We want to isolate into our own self. Um, you're going to see things like the Scopes trial. Okay, that was the trial with evolution where the science teacher was put on trial um, so you see this clash in the 1920s of this new idea, this new womanhood, the flapper. But then there's also this pullback of mm -mm, we have strict morals that we want to keep, too. So it's that clash between the two. Um, after the 20s, we're going to have the Great Depression and the New Deal. Um, this is also big thing about New Deal is make sure that you know um, the recovery plan, okay, that there were three parts, this Roosevelt's three R's, 
Um, you're also going to have the court packing plan where Roosevelt tries to put more people in the Supreme Court in order to get his New Deal programs passed. And then we end with World War II. OK, so um, one of the ones I saw um, circled a good bit was Executive Order 9066. OK, this is what desegregated the military. And then the double V campaign, again, African-Americans fighting for um, liberty abroad and liberty at home. All right. That was a big spill in time period seven. Quick. All right. Real quickly, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on thesis and contextualization because we have about 15 minutes left. And I would really like to get to um, looking at some of the happy documents for you so you can see examples. I think students reading examples are one of the best um, practices. So just real quick, um, remember that if you can understand how to write your thesis and contextualization, that is going to help you on both the DBQ and the LEQ. The requirements are the exact same for both. Um, so your thesis needs to be one or more sentences. I would say it needs to be about two sentences. Um, and I tell my students, I don't give them the option. This needs to be the last sentence of your first paragraph, period. If you want to put it at the end, again, just to reinforce it, you can. But it needs to be the end of your first paragraph. You do not want the reader guessing what you're trying to argue throughout your essay. You want it to be very clear for them, okay? Um, so it has to have a historically defensible claim and a line of reason, okay? So here's the prompt. Evaluate the relative importance of different causes of the U.S. expanding the role of the United States in the World War from 1865 to 1910. And then we have this one, too. I'm going to skip past these because I want to get to some examples for you. OK, um, contextualization. Big thing I want to harp on contextualization, guys. Contextualization to me is the easiest point of the DBQ and the LEQ to get. I tell my students, you better not miss contextualization, okay? Because contextualization, all you are doing is you're setting up the background information for what you are about to write about. Um, when you think contextualization, make sure that your contextualization is relevant to the prompt, okay? So for example, if your contextualization, if your essay, let's say your essay is asking about um, the economic policies in the 1980s, okay? That would be Reaganomics, all right? You have to write about the economy before the 1980s in your contextualization. It needs to be about the economy. It doesn't need to be necessarily about the hippie movement because that's not relevant to the prompt, okay? So your background needs to be relevant to the prompt and it needs to be right before what you're about to write about. Um, the best way I can give you, the best analogy I can give you to this is if you are starting a new season of your favorite show on Netflix, the first two minutes of that show is going to be a recap of what happened in season one. And that's what you're doing. You're recapping what happened before. And then here's my argument. And here's how I'm going to prove it. And then you get into the writing of your essay. Okay. Okay. Um, let's do look at these for a few minutes, because this is also going to help us on some content review. Um, which of these broad concepts on the right could be used as contextualization for this question? Okay, so again, 1865 to 1910, evaluate the relative importance of different causes for the expanding role of the United States in the world. So what is a cause? for the U.S. going into imperialism. So what we're looking at is what could be background for this.
All right, so for this one, um, what you should have um, written through, highlighted through, is U.S. industrialization and European grab for Africa. Okay, that's what sets up the United States expanding into other parts of the world. Um, U.S. industrialization, I kind of spoke on this on time period six, but that has to do with expanding markets. Okay, the U.S., due to industrialization, they have a lot more in their economy, a lot more products, and they needed good open trade relations with other nations. Think about China, the open door policy, okay? Um, and then European grab for Africa. At the time, Europeans were basically colonizing Africa, and America saw this and didn't want to be left out of the colonization, all right? All right, let's try this one. If you can enter a yes or a no and tell me if you think this example earned the contextualization point. All right, overwhelmingly, the majority of you put yes, and that is correct, okay? Um, where we see this from is um, the Civil War, industrial output, and competition from Europe, okay? Those are all some of those broad concepts that are outlined in this paragraph that gives you the background for what you need. All right, let's try this one. What could you use as background, as contextualization for the question, evaluate the relative importance of the causes of cultural changes in the United States from 1914 to 1945. Okay, so what would have led to some cultural changes? All right, so if we're looking at these guys, all of these could be used except for the last one, okay? The economic policy, laissez-faire economic policy. Um, and this goes back to guys, your contextualization has to match your prompt, okay? This isn't asking you about economic changes. It's asking you about cultural changes. So you wouldn't use the economy in this one. All right, let's read this example and tell me if you think it gets the point. All right, good job. All of you, or the majority of you said no. It's too vague, okay? There's nothing broad, there's nothing specific in it. It doesn't give us enough information. All right, I'm gonna skip through um, some more of this contextualization because I want us to make sure that we touch on real quickly document analysis, okay? So document analysis is the same thing as happy. When you happy the document. Okay. All right. So happying the document. Um, this is where you're going to get your point for doing one part. Okay. Either showing historical context, um, audience, purpose, or point of view. Okay. You do not have to do all of those for one document. You only have to do one per document. Okay. Um, you also, the why 
That's why the why is in there. And the why is really important is because you are not just telling what it is. You have to make that connection. Okay. So you have to do this for at least three documents. Um, I would suggest doing four documents. Okay. At least four. That way you can get the description point and you could get the happy point. Okay. So guys, if you are doing a DBQ, let's think about this. If you get contextualization, thesis, description of the document, happy of the document, and then outside evidence, that's a five out of seven. And that is a fabulous score. Okay, so just think about that as you're thinking about documents. And if it stresses you out to think, oh my gosh, I've got to get through all seven documents so I can get my six support points, let that point go and get your other ones. Okay, all right, so to happy a document, um, just reviewing these skills real quick. I feel like you know these, but just to make sure um, H stands for historical context. Can you bring into the open connections, the facts that are happening when this document's created. Um, really important thing about this is, especially if it's an image, you want to think about what was taking place when the image was created, not you looking at the image today, okay? In what stance was this created in? Um, audience, who was this intended for? Guys, it's not enough on this to just say the audience was women or the audience was the Senate. You have to explain that connection on why is the audience women? How do you know that? Um, purpose, why was it created? And then point of view. Um, point of view, I just wanna give you some caution with point of view. Point of view is great to use if you know a lot about the author, if you know a lot about the source or where it's coming from. If you don't, point of view is not your best bet, okay? All right, um, we're gonna look at how you do this. When analyzing a document, you should do three things, okay? You need to provide an overview of what's going on in the document, okay? That's your description. You need to source the document, that's your happy that we just went over. And then you need one sentence to close your analysis, tie it all back in, okay? So. Look over at the left using documents to make an overview, overview and citation, source and argument. Okay, here's your question. Evaluate the extent of changes and ideas about American independence from 1763 to 1783. The ideas about American independence changed greatly from 1763 to 1783. In the beginning, colonists only wanted representation and a say in the legislation of new laws. But by 1783, Americans want a true freedom from British rule. All right, here's your first document. Notice this is an example, okay? How does this response do each of these three things? The first sentence is your overview of the document, okay? Samuel Adams argued that people have the right to change a government that disputes intolerable oppression. Um, I would also add here, guys, this is called the description point. Um, when you are describing a document, I would describe what it is like in the image or in the speech by Samuel Adams. That way you're just clear. It just helps clear things up. Um, the second sentence is how it is sourced. Adam's sentiments are of a patriot point of view, for he, along with many others, disapproved of Britain's tyrannical rule over the colonies. All right, I want to point out, do you remember how I said if you're doing point of view or audience, you just can't say the point of view is? If this person would have said Adam's sentiments are of a patriot point of view and stopped there, he would not have gotten the source point because we don't know what that patriot point of view is. After the comma is where we find out what that point of view is. And then the last sentence is the support. His claim that people can reform or create a new government if the old ones is oppressive illustrates a clear change in the idea regarding independence. All right, so you gotta have all three. Um, 
Okay, one last tip. If you consider the fact that having three documents is in using the collection of three, you're gonna get two points, okay? So just remember, that's a good way to get your points. Um, okay, I want to let us look at this one. This is kind of, we got three minutes. So we're gonna close out with this particular question. Um, evaluate, here's our prompt. Evaluate the relative importance of different causes for the expanding role of the United States in the world from 1865 to 1910. All right, so use this image. Make sure you pay attention to your source and then see if you can come up with the happy for this document. So we want to cite what's happening in the document, source it, and then tie it in in our last sentence. So give me three sentences and then we'll be done. Okay. Sorry. Okay, one thing I want to point out, guys, because I'm seeing this a lot, and I know we only have one minute, but I want to make sure I point this out. Um, you guys are making a common mistake that was actually a mistake when this was used in the AP exam. Um, this is not dealing with Native Americans, okay? It's dealing with imperialism, and you know that based on the date, 1901, and it being Puck. Puck was the popular magazine. It's up to them. So Uncle Sam is holding two people in his hands and is saying, you have two choices. On the left is a school teacher. On the right is military. You choose. We're, in, we're putting our doctrine on you. You choose which one you want. Okay, so just wanted to point that out. Um, I want to be conscious of your time. Okay, it is 8.15. So we're going to finish. You will have access to these examples that I'm clicking through at the end. Guys, this is fabulous study for you. Fabulous examples for you to review before your exam, okay? So if you can make sure and fill in the Google link before you leave, Miss Allen and I will hang out on the Zoom for a few minutes and answer any questions you may have. But once you have completed the Google link, you are free to go.
Miss Allen, we have a question um, about the quarantine speech. And I feel like you explained it really good the other day. So I'm going to ask you if you'll explain it because I feel like you could do it better than I could. Um, the question is, why was it called the quarantine speech if FDR was arguing that the U.S. should expand foreign involvement? You're muted. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so the idea behind that one is that we were still staying quarantined from the action directly, if that makes sense. So what he was arguing for in 19, that's 37, right? 1937 mm -hmm. was that we had to actually morally, we had a moral obligation to help our allies because by 1937, Hitler is already starting to expand into throughout Europe. So we've already had him going into Czechoslovakia, um, going in, remember, to, uh, uh, all, you'll end up in Austria and Poland, part of the whole appeasement deal. So with Churchill and the European countries have been appeasing uh, Hitler, and we, we are going into, Roosevelt is saying, hey, like, we know where this is going, and we have a moral obligation to help the allies. But remember, up until this point, we've still been in this isolationist period. So while he's saying we have a moral obligation to help, he is not meaning boots on the ground. He is meaning we need to provide assistance. So that leads us to the cash and carry plan and the lease, Lend Lease Act where we start first was cash and carry. They came over, they paid cash, they carried it off. I call it the yard sale plan. It was like yard sale for military equipment. Come and bring cash, take it off. Well, then when the allies got more and more involved, they no longer had the cash flow to do that. So we went to the Lend Lease Act where we would loan them and the, uh, and the idea was that they would eventually pay us back. And so that's why the quarantine, quarantining is not, it's, it's quarantining us from getting directly involved, but we were still, he's advocating for us to say, hey, like, if we don't do something, it's going to get worse. We have a moral obligation to help our allies. Thank you. That was such a good You're welcome. I felt like you could, so when I saw the question, I was like, oh, she's got this way better than I do. <laughs> Absolutely, no problem. All right, Bailey or Naeem, do you have a question? If not, I'm going to kick y'all off the call. Oh, Bailey said she was listening in. <laughs> oh, oops, sorry, Bailey. That's okay. Um, they actually participated pretty well. Yeah, they did. I mean, I love that you told them that this was part of their, like, this is how they get credit for it. I think that helped. They participated definitely better than Tuesday. We had a lot, too, and you had a lot on Tuesday, which makes me think, are we going to have anybody on Saturday? I know. I kind of wonder about that, too. I mean, I think you had, I had 35, and I want to say you had around 28. Mm -hmm. Is Madison County on spring break? I have no idea. I just wonder if that, well, and it's Easter weekend. There may, I don't know, you know. Well, I was wondering about Easter weekend because I know y'all, like, if y'all are out Good Friday, I bet other people are out Good Friday, which probably means we're going to have less. Yeah, I would think so. But then again, I wouldn't have thought that, you know, I don't know. Who knows? JSU 